many amazing speakers. Very good. So shall we? Um... Yes, you can start, Lisa. Excellent. Okay, thank you so much. Um, colleagues, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, my name is Lisa Kerbill. I'm delighted to welcome you. Uh, to this side event of COP27 um, uh, and the, the next and exciting event of the Breakthrough Alliance, um, which uh, demonstrates the partnership between the Joint SDG Fund and um, leaders in the tech and media world. Um, I'm really honored here to be uh, representing the United Nations um, just 90 minutes or so since um, the UN Secretary General addressed the COP27 delegates in Sharm el-Sheikh. Um, he was underlining the urgency for so many issues to be addressed um, with only 24 hours remaining in the negotiations. And he reminded us that, you know, the real recipe uh, for, for solving this is to rise at, to the moment, that we as humanity have to rise to this moment. Um, one of our greatest challenges as a race, as a human race, and his message was very, very simple. We have to stand and deliver. We have to stand and deliver not only on climate change, but on the sustainable development goals. A foundational piece, colleagues, that he that he raised in, in COP was this idea of financial support to developing countries, to emerging markets, and, and what a climate solidarity pact can mean going forward. Essentially to bring the financial and the tech support to those emerging economies to accelerate their transition uh, to renewables. He went so far as to call renewables as the exit ramp from the climate hell highway. Um, and I think if, if renewables are the exit ramp, then the Joint SDG Fund and this Breakthrough Alliance wants to be the HOV lane or the fast lane or, or the, the lane that brings us there faster and it brings us there together. Um, you can only be in the HOV lane if you have more, you know, more than one person, unless you're in an electric car, I understand, in California. So you're either making choices for sustainability or you're bringing along partners. And the Joint SDG Fund was created by the General Assembly only three years ago to do exactly that. We were meant to break down the silos of how the UN operates. We were meant to blend public and private monies. And we were meant to do that always with a focus on those that are most vulnerable. And always to remember that bottom quintile in that country and that faraway village and that mother with five children with no income. And so colleagues, it's very serious what we discussed. This breakthrough alliance is meant to save lives. It's meant to to change livelihoods and to, to build futures for children who right now might not see one for themselves. And that's why we're here. And I'm so thrilled that the co-chairs, the co-founders and, and the co-leads of, of today's conversation um, are volunteering to do this. They stepped forward when I was looking for help, how to socialize this part of the UN system, how to bring the Joint SDG Fund, which has tremendous support from generous governments like the European Union and others, but yet needs to go further, needs to go to Silicon Valley, needs to go deeper into the worlds of venture and angel investing. And sure enough, this is the second event of the Breakthrough Alliance. We had a very successful conversation during the General Assembly. And now we're launching this conversation during COP very strategically with critical partners and leaders on this call. Um, so without further ado, I'm delighted to, to pass to Radhika Shah, um, as well as to Keith Coleman, the two, the two co-founders of this Breakthrough Alliance who will walk us through their vision of how they see the interconnectivity, the interdisciplinary links between what the UN is doing and what they're already doing in their roles. And then we can't wait to hear from our esteemed panelists and speakers as we go forward. Thank you so much and Radhika, over to you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'm Radhika Asha, co-president of Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs a Silicon Valley-based Stanford community of 2,000 plus alumna, faculty, and students come together to advance tech innovation and entrepreneurship. Honored to be in community with everyone and to welcome each of you on behalf of the event co-conveners, the Breakthrough Alliance of the UN Joint SDG Fund, Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs, Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs of Southern California, and Stanford Alumni and Sustainability. This moment of grave crisis when world leaders have come together at COP to find values to come and uh, ways um, and find synergies to combat climate change is also a moment of great opportunity. The green energy transition can and must happen faster and much more cost-effectively with disruptive policy innovations 
innovative tech solutions and unusual partnerships. The very integrity of our oceans is at significant risk due to a range of ocean management policy market failures, over exploitation, pollution, introduction of uh, invasive species, habitat loss, acidification, and more. Private capital can and must be engaged if you are to unlock the much needed investments. Women, migrants, refugees, indigenous people, and other vulnerable communities are impacted the most by climate change and often left behind. We can equitably combat the climate change crisis in the spirit of the SDGs of leaving no one behind, only if we keep such groups at the center of the dialogues and think of how any solution will impact them first and foremost. We are very excited today to bring together brilliant entrepreneurial Stanford faculty, key energy policy leaders from the EU, my own state of California, leading impact investors, funding the blue economy, the United Nations Foundation and NGO leaders who are at the forefront of the leading the systems change needed in our world to combat the climate crisis equitably while also advancing human development. We will hear insights on the challenges and opportunities to advance the green transition and the blue economy today. To me personally, the SDGs enshrine the Gandhian ethos of viewing our relationship to nature as that of a custodian rather than viewing nature as a resource for us to exploit and of respecting human dignity. This is also very much the spirit of this breakthrough alliance of tech and media funders for acceleration of the sustainable development goals a collaboration and an innovation think and action type of sorts within the UN system with the spirit of public-private partnerships, cross-sectoral, cross-regional collaboration, leveraging the power of digital technology, science, media, markets, and entrepreneurship. The Alliance aims to identify barriers and opportunities in co-creating intersectional inclusive climate solutions and informing the design of equitable climate policy. At this new catalytic breakthrough alliance launched under the auspices of the joint SDG fund during UNGA Climate Week, we are bringing together brilliant academics, technology, business, science innovators, funders from private sector and philanthropy, along with local and global policy makers with a passion to combat the climate crisis and create opportunities for all. We focus on three core pillars, accelerating and driving awareness of the SDGs in America and beyond, catalyzing a nexus of regional investors, funders, and policymakers from Silicon Valley and Hollywood to bring the power of tech, media, and policy innovation and investment to advance the SDGs, and connecting the global community to bring the power of tech and innovation and impact investment to advance the SDGs. Next, we will hear from my colleague Keith Coleman, co-founder and co-chair of the Breakthrough Alliance, and also co-founder of Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs of Southern California. Over to you, Keith. Well, thank you, Erotica, and, and thank you, Lisa. Uh, we certainly appreciate the, the UN family and express deep thanks to Lisa Herbiel and the Joint SDG Fund team uh, for their professionalism and their passion and greeting to folks uh, around the globe and here in the United States. And we welcome this presence at COP27 and this digital curated experience. Again, here today, we remain humble and curious, recognizing the urgency of sustaining our planet and embracing the spirit of leaving no one behind and the creating opportunity for all. I'm pleased to be a co-founder and co-chair with my fellow alum, uh, Stanford alum, Radhika Shah, uh, of this Breakthrough Alliance of Tech and Media Funders for the acceleration uh, of the SDGs. As an interdisciplinary thought leader and scholar emeritus of Media X at Stanford, the ethos of the SDGs were truly imbued in the process of our members' intellectual curiosity and drive for practical applications. And it's this very same intersection and relationship between people, media, finance, and technology that can enhance and improve the adoption of the SDGs uh, across the globe and in America. And we must retell this SDG story. You know, COP27 has provided another opportunity to raise awareness of the need for direct climate action. And climate change is something that we can do something about because it is human behavior. We can stop and do more for climate change and all these greenhouse gas emissions, 112 million tons a day. We've got to slow down and decline emissions. Clearly, the UN SDGs and climate change as a base, we've got to get a handle on that. Without that, we'll get more hunger, more poverty, and increasing problems. And as climate action as a priority, we can increase jobs and drive a positive future for all. 
Now, key here is to see that this Breakthrough Alliance is an opportunity through the Joint SDG Fund to raise awareness and promote UN and US values as congruent and compatible and like-minded. And we believe that this is a key moment for the US itself to reinvest, reinvent, and recommit to lead the charge in this collaboration with the global community. And we saw those remarks from uh, Mr. Kerry and President Biden uh, last week at COP. It's important again, as Radhika and Lisa have described, to view the SDGs in a layered framework, global, national, state, and through a local prism. And this vertical integration can assist in these positive interventions and to move these at scale through public and private financing, uh, hopefully by 2030, through the support of new tech and media storytelling. Where there's hardworking, committed administrators uh, in the education space and secondary and universities that also need to be at the table. And the Alliance, as Radhika described, aims to partner with multi-sector stakeholders to promote the same kind of thought leadership, catalyzing support, implementing programs uh, as such. Now, it's clear that science and technology matter. You know, this government and science partnership is not new. Uh, it's, it, the government needs to fund and continue to fund basic research. And the private sector must be at the table regarding innovative finance and market execution. Now in the United States, the recent Inflation Reduction Act, federal policy that really resonated in terms of sustainable development and, and the goals thereof, lowering healthcare costs and energy costs, creating good jobs for workers, tackling climate change, that's federal. At the state level, California uh, continues to lead and innovate with catalytic finance models and new types of incentives that support the spirit of the SDGs. Through, we'll hear later from, through California Energy Commission Chair David Hochschild, his vision for decarbonization strategies in wind, energy storage, clean energy tech, and research, to also to State Treasurer Fiona Ma's leadership in the California Dream for All and the shared appreciation model that gives the state the ability to invest its budget surplus in a revolving investment fund, allowing the state to invest and loans alongside first-time homebuyers of women and people of color and in marginalized communities. Locally and building community, we've got to remember and respect those closest to the challenges, but they're also keen first movers uh, on solutions, whether it be solar or renewable energy as climate solutions. This recognition is also seen as a good creation, job creation strategy and as a positive attribute to local neighborhoods. And here again is where opportunity lies on a global, national, uh, state, and local scale. In states like Hawaii, where innovation efforts have shown that the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy has seen that Hawaiian policies to reduce energy waste and combat change have been ha positively highlighted with the state's definitive actions taken in clean energy and transportation projects and efforts to improve resiliency, support equity, and aid in economic recovery. The SDGs can support also public health innovation to mitigate disparities in underrepresented patients. So we want to continue to provide this kind of leadership at scale in public-private partnerships. And we are, again, uh, very honored to have a number of Stanford alumni and industrialists and policymakers and students uh, joining today's launch, along with other brilliant folks in terms of California global scientists, technologists, and, and UN leaders. This is a global issue, and it's also uh, an American issue in terms of the SDGs really being a part of that, that ethos of American values as well. So Radhika, Lisa, and I really see these SDGs almost as American, uh, as, as mom and apple pie. And these SDGs can drive actionable processes and solutions and in intersectional challenges across the globe in the US. And again, critical time for the global community to reimagine relearn and deliver the SDGs for humanity and Americans alike, starting with directed, financeable, executable climate action. So thank you so much and back to you, Raik. Thank you, Keith. Uh, without further ado, we will start our opening session where we will be inviting high level perspectives from key government and UN leaders. I'm honored to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dita Juliansen, Director General of the European Commission where she leads the Directorate General and its efforts to ensure access to affordable, secure, and clean energy for all Europeans, and to drive the process of becoming the first climate neutral continent while contributing to Europe's sustainable growth and energy security. Prior to this role, she was head of the cabinet for the EU Competition Commissioner, 
steering work to ensure companies compete equally and fairly on their own merits to benefit consumers, businesses, and the European economy as a whole. A committed EU civil servant, she was senior manager in the Directorate General for Trade, leading EU enforcement policy and negotiations in the World Trade Organization. She has served as head of the economic section of the EU delegation to the United Nations in New York, representing the EU on trade, sustainable development, international partnerships, finance, and legal issues. She's a law graduate from the University of Copenhagen and the College of Europe, uh, an inspiring leader from the EU. Welcome, Director General Dita Ewell Janssen. Thank you so much, Radhika. Thank you very much, everyone, for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure to be here as part of COP27 uh, at today's uh, launch. So what I would like to do is to start by setting a, a bit the context of today's event from a European uh, perspective uh, and say something about how we are approaching this important uh, transition. Uh, Russia continues its war in Ukraine. Uh, Russia continues the weaponization of uh, energy. Uh, and Russia has continued its efforts to destabilize the global energy market with very significant impact uh, directly in, in Europe, of course. The response we have put together to that disruption from Russia has been what we call Repower EU. It is a strategy on how do we shift away from our dependence on Russian fossil fuel, how do we invest in our own energy systems to make them more independent, more resilient, but of course also more green, more sustainable, more clean. Um, and in our Repower EU strategy, we rely on three pillars. The first is that we need to reduce consumption. We need to be more energy efficient. We need to be uh, better at saving energy. We need to learn to do more with less energy, essentially. So reducing consumption. The second pillar is uh, renewables. Uh, and you've mentioned it also in the opening. The UN Secretary General has recognized the role of renewable energy in addressing the climate challenge. So what we're trying to do is to accelerate and scale up the investment in and rollout of renewables so that renewable energy can replace the fossil fuel that we've previously imported from, from Russia, among others. And then the third pillar of our Repower EU is replacing replacing the Russian fuels by molecules with supplies from trusted partners and, and with cleaner supplies where that is possible. Uh, and just to give you a sense of the proportions of what we are going through in this energy change, last year and over the last several years, about 40% of our natural gas came from Russia. This is now down to 7%. So a very, very significant shift in our energy mix and a, a very quick shift towards cleaner and greener energy. The way we do this is, first of all, we have established targets in our regulatory framework, higher targets for energy efficiency, higher targets for renewable energy as a share of our overall mix. And we have set up fora where we work with industry, we work with researchers, we work with interest and consumer groups. And, and then, of course, we try to create the best possible business environment, investment climate for renewables like solar, hydrogen and biomethane uh, to thrive. And to give you one example of how we do it uh, in relation to renewable energy, what we have uh, seen is that one of the biggest challenges in terms of accelerating and scaling up renewables is the permitting process and administrative delays. And so here what we've done is we've suggested shorter deadlines, shorter binding deadlines, one-stop shop uh, approaches, really to make it faster to acquire the necessary permits so that investments can take place and we can accelerate the rollout of, the, of renewables. And, and we do see a, a good impact by that. One of the critical points uh, in working in this uh, crisis is to make sure that every action we take, also when it's urgent and also when it's an emergency, that that action on our energy system uh, and for our energy security is also fully aligned with our climate neutrality objectives by uh, becoming climate neutral by 2050. So that's our European Green Deal. And of course, also fully aligned with the sustainable development goals that is our global framework and uh, within which we work with our partners. Um, in terms of innovation and what more is needed, what we see is that about half of the emission reductions that are needed by 2050 will have to come from technologies that are not yet on the market. So we need to focus more, we need a sharper focus on digitalization, research and innovation, uh, and again, cooperation with our international partners. If, as you have just said, Keith, this is a, a global crisis, the framework is, is global, and we need to, to find solutions together. Um, as policymakers, uh, we need to make sure we play our part. 
uh, obviously through our legislative framework, our regulatory framework, but also to make sure that we encourage investments, that we encourage coordination with other decision makers, with stakeholders and with interest groups, including at local level as well as at global level. Um, in innovation and technology, we are far uh, advanced uh, in Europe. We are world -like leaders in terms of patents um, and in particular in renewable energy, uh, but we still see significant untapped potential here. So to give you one example of what more is needed, uh, we see that innovative data services, apps, energy management systems that can help monitor the energy consumption are critical for the green transition. They can help reduce cost for consumers, but they can also help consumers take uh, greener choices, more climate friendly choices. So here, innovation and technology is really key for the consumers uh, to, to play the role that they would want to play and to benefit uh, from that. Um, a few words about financing and investment before I, I round uh, off. It's clear that to make the changes that are necessary and that we want to make in our energy systems to align with our climate objectives, to go through the green transition uh, and to help make sure that we meet the sustainable development goals, we are going to need significant investments. Uh, our Repower EU plan that I just mentioned alone will require about 210 billion euro over the next five years. So very significant amounts uh, to be invested into technology, into infrastructure, into renewable energy generation. We have significant EU funds that can help the clean energy transition. Uh, and we've got significant funds that can help on the research and innovation. Uh, the most important one in Europe is what we call Horizon Europe. And that provides around 100 billion euros, so more or less 100 billion dollars. And, and as part of that, we have earmarked a very significant amount, a very significant share to energy, climate change and, uh, and greening the transport. And of course, those are the public funds only. What we need to make sure is that that is matched by private investments. Uh, we have our Invest EU program that leverages private investment in the order of 370 billion euros of public and private investments in projects such as research and innovation. Um, just a few days ago, we have published a report on competitiveness and clean energy transition technologies that underpins a lot of the work we're doing, doing uh, and that confirms significant progress in terms of um, where we're, what we've been able to do, but it also identifies a number of remaining challenges. And again, challenges where I think we need to work together globally, including with our US partners. One of those challenges that I just want to mention is the continued dependence on critical raw materials uh, and the fact that a very large share of the global raw materials market is processed uh, in, in, in one supplier in one country. And then the other thing we also see in, in Europe is a significant shortage of the skills that are necessary to develop the clean energy technologies. Uh, and so we're really building the skills agenda around the green transition, around climate change and around what we need to do in order to achieve climate neutrality in 2050. And then, as I said already, a further challenge is, of course, to make sure we have the necessary digital infrastructure, which is critical to achieve our climate uh, and energy uh, targets. So just uh, to sum up, the critical point here is that the energy and climate crisis are, uh, are two parallel crises. They're equally urgent in nature. And the response to the energy crisis that we're currently in has to also provide a response to the climate crisis to make sure that we accelerate the energy transition uh, and, uh, and get there in the smartest way together with partners, uh, again, globally and, and locally. The European Green Deal that I have mentioned and the Repower EU plan that aims to reduce our dependence on Russian fossil, both require a very deep transformation of our energy system and of our economies. And we need to make sure we do that in an interactive and smart way so that we help both businesses and consumers embrace what are genuine benefits of the green transition, both for the planet, uh, but also for the individual uh, European uh, and, um, and, and the individual global citizen. So thank you very much for that. Gita, thank you so much. Um, and I would be remiss without also acknowledging the generous um, contributions to the Joint SDG Fund by the European Union. You have been a strong and solid partner in the, in the realm of innovation um, around financing frameworks for the SDGs, that building of the ecosystem to accelerate planning and, and budgeting at, at country level for the SDGs. And now, as we pivot into 2023, um, your colleagues in Brussels and here in New York are helping us run a digital connectivity investment, which I hope will also um, align very well with the with the um, the work that we're doing on clean energy. So we really, really salute this leadership, the examples you've given, but also within the UN family, um, you've been a very direct um, and, and relevant reason why the Joint SDG Fund is standing tall today, is able to to kind of convene such events. So sincere appreciation.
um, and colleagues, um, we will go back to Dita with a question um, after we go through all of our speakers, but it's now my absolute delight to um, introduce Ms. Sanda Ojiambo, who is Assistant Secretary General, Executive Director and CEO of the UN Global Compact. Um, and Sanda is a, um, is a leader in many ways. Um, she, during the COVID-19 pandemic, launched um, an ambitious new UN Global Compact strategy to really ensure the acceleration and scaling up of global collective impact by business for business, um, specifically around upholding the 10 principles of the compact and for delivery of the sustainable development goals. Um, and she's been looking at how ecosystems, um, another theme I think that we could start to see from a conversation today, um, how that can enable change. Um, and she's been promoting stronger business engagement under and with UN partners um, to deliver and finance the 2030 agenda and naturally um, been very active um, with COP27 as well. I had the pleasure to know Sanda when she was um, head of sustainable business and social impact in Nairobi, Kenya for Safaricom. Um, and even then she, she, uh, she demonstrated tremendous leadership with and for the UN um, at, at such a pivotal time. So without further ado, Sanda, I pass the floor to you. Great, thank you so much, Lisa, for that uh, warm welcome and your reflections on on how we go years back. Absolutely, and really, you know, also great to hear comments from Radhika, from Keith, and from from Dita. Um, to those joining, it's really a pleasure to to be with you here today um, for this important forum. You know, the other speakers have spoken about really the importance of catalyzing sustainable finance. And you know this will fully require the leadership of initiatives like the SDG Fund and all of the other partners gathered here today. You know, thank you for this commitment, and we do need a lot more commitment and a lot more action to move towards the more just and sustainable world that we all need. I just wanted today to share some reflections from recent gatherings, COP27 and the B20, and really focus my comments perhaps on areas of implementation, action, and accountability from a private sector lens. Um, you know, we've all seen how the three C's of the global crises, climate change, COVID-19 and conflicts are steadily eroding, sadly, the decade of the last decade of development achievements. But the private sector continues to have a key role to play in moving this forward. During my time at COP27 last week, I heard a clear call to action for the business community to step up and address the climate crisis in many ways. And I'll speak about those. A thread throughout COP27 was a need for transparency and accountability from the private sector and indeed all other non-state actors. The UN Secretary General's recently launched Technical Experts Report, which was aptly titled Integrity Matters, calls on all non-state actors, including the private sector, to hold their net zero commitments to the highest standards. A bit about what we're doing towards this goal, the UN Global Compact is a founding partner of the Science-Based Targets Initiative, the SBTI, which has become a standard for credible climate targets. Between 2015 and 2020, companies with approved targets through SBTI reduced their emissions by 29%, exceeding global trends. Companies with committed and validated targets through the SBTI now cover over one third of the global economy with a $38 trillion in market capitalization. Not only will these companies invest in green energy to meet their own targets, but also the global scale of these participating businesses sends a clear message to the market. Another clear message coming from COP27 was that it was truly is time for businesses to prioritize investments in adaptation and resilience assessing risks, providing or investing capital where possible, and taking a keen look through their supply chains. And as businesses compete to advance sustainable economies and growth, they must also ensure that the transition towards this is just and inclusive, because after all, at the heart of the climate crisis are people and livelihoods. Just one example where we're taking a deep dive and a, a look towards implementation and results. The global maritime industry is a heavy greenhouse gas emitter, but also a huge employer of millions around the world. So for these reasons, I was really thrilled while as a COP to help the Maritime Just Transition Task Force launch an action plan developed by ship owners, seafarers, unions, and UN organizations, i.e. people, to upskill seafarers to meet these ambitious transition and decarbonization goals. 
The plan also includes actions for a more just and inclusive environment for the maritime workforce, championing diversity, equity, and inclusion in often an industry that we don't really see uh, what happens below the deck, should I say, but also ensuring health and safety first approaches. Reflecting on later uh, in the week or later last week where I attended the B20 summit in Indonesia, there was also the launch of the Oceans 20 initiative that ties in very well to the climate transition agenda. This initiative will provide a platform for global businesses, G20 countries and other stakeholders to deliver on an ambitious oceans target and leverage blue and sustainable market opportunities. We all know, ladies and gentlemen gathered here, that we will not achieve the SDGs without private sector investments, and then therefore the mobilization of financial markets is much needed. With more than $17 trillion in annual investments in capital expenditures, research and development, talent and marketing, private corporations are truly key levers in the sustainability transition of the global economy. Here at the Global Compact and through our CFO coalition for the SDGs, we aim to aid the creation of a $10 trillion market for SDG-linked finance by 2030. Corporations will compete for capital based on the ambitiousness and credibility of their targets and their performance linked to the SDGs in a transparent and accountable way. So we've been working alongside financial institutions, UN partners, and key stakeholders to advance financial innovation, including for SDG-linked bonds. So despite the current context of financial markets, it's encouraging to see that sustainable bonds are gaining ground, demonstrating a strong demand for transition finance from private investors. To all of you, dear friends, the road ahead will not be easy. It is complex, as you've heard from previous speakers. But the good news is that we already know how to solve so many of the problems before us. And from a global financial perspective, there is no shortage of capital. But what we must all do is commit to a long-term investment in humanity. And I know that this is truly possible. So back over to you, Lisa, and looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Sanda, for your, your, your visionary remarks uh, and your passion and commitment. Uh, it's truly inspiring and aspirational. Um, at this time, I'd like to uh, introduce um, the... California Energy Commission Chair, Mr. David Hochschild. Um, Mr. Hochschild was appointed Chair of the California Energy Commission by Governor Gavin Newsom in February of 2019, and he fills this environmental position on the five-member commission, uh, where four of the members are required by law to have professional training in specific areas, such as engineering, uh, physical science, environmental protection, and economics and, and law. And Chair Hochschild's career has spanned public service, environmental advocacy, and the private sector. Uh, he initially got involved in the solar energy field in 2001 in San Francisco as a special assistant to Mayor Willie Brown, where Chair Hochschild launched a citywide $100 million initiative to put solar panels on public buildings. Uh, he also co-founded the Vote Solar Initiative, a 60,000-member advocacy organization promoting solar policies at local, state, and federal levels. Uh, he was also executive director of a national consortium of leading solar manufacturers and worked for five years at Solaria, a solar company in Silicon Valley. From 2007 to 2008, he served as a commissioner at the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. And for his work to advance clean energy, Chair Hochschild was awarded the Sierra Club's Trailblazer Award, the American Lung Association's Clean Air Hero Award, and the U.S. Department of Energy's Million Solar Roof True Champion Award. These are just remarkable accomplishments. Uh, Chair Hochschild holds a Bachelor of Arts from Swarthmore College and a Master of Public Policy from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. And he was also a Coral Fellow in Public Affairs. Uh, very pleased to have you, Chair Hochschild. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Keith, for that uh, generous eulogy and uh, good to be with everybody um, and, and join you for the discussion today. I'm David Hochschild, I'm Chair of the California Energy Commission. I want to share a little bit about what's happening in our state. We are a state of 40 million people, fifth largest economy in the world, and we're all in on the project of building a clean energy future together. I want to note that in California, really alternative energy is the wrong term to use to describe renewables. Fossil fuels are really alternative on our grid. We're getting almost two thirds of our electricity today from clean carbon free source of energy like solar, wind, geothermal, and so forth. Um, 
and we're en route to get to 100% by 2045 and 90% by 2035. Uh, and really a lot of what we're working on is extending the reach of that clean electricity into every sector of our society. So really the electrification of almost everything and empowering the grid with carbon-free electricity. That's sort of the core strategy. Um, a couple highlights I wanna draw your attention to. Um, transportation electrification has been a huge focus for us. We're spending $10 billion on electric vehicle incentives and electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Uh, EVs have been our number one export in California. We're making over 2,000 electric vehicles a day in the state of California, 43 different facilities manufacturing EVs, and almost 20% of new vehicles that are purchased um, are electric. And that is going to be required to be 100% uh, of all new vehicle purchased by 2035. So <clears throat> what we're seeing here is really, I would say, both environmental and climate policy and industrial strategy, uh, because there's incredible opportunity here uh, as we're scaling up, um, not just passenger vehicles like Tesla, but also electric buses made by companies like Proterra and BYD and electric motorcycles and scooters and all the rest of it. Um, and uh, we wanna be very intelligent about the charging protocols that go along with electric vehicles so they can help support the electric grid. Uh, we want everything that's connected to the grid to be a good citizen of the grid. And that's a really important part of the strategy. Another, uh, I would say, cornerstone of our, of our climate policy in California is offshore wind. So this summer, we set a goal for the state of California, 25 gigawatts. Uh, to give you some sense of that, the whole state electric demand is 50 gigawatts. So this is a really big commitment. And um, in about two weeks, uh, the first lease sale will happen on federal waters off the coast of California for offshore wind. It'll be 583 square miles. Um, that will be the first offshore wind project uh, on the west coast of the United States. And offshore wind is an amazing resource. One rotation of uh, an offshore wind turbine can power a house for a day. That's how much electricity is being generated uh, by that resource. And our projects are gonna be quite far offshore. So the zone that we're talking about doesn't even begin until 20 miles offshore uh, and it goes from 20 to 30. Um, so another big piece of the puzzle is building electrification and building decarbonization. We're putting a billion dollars into these incentives and we're really focusing the incentives uh, on low income housing to get uh, folks who are in low income housing uh, you know, off of natural gas onto clean electricity um, and electric heat pumps, electric induction cooktops and so forth. Uh, and we're pushing that as well through our building code for uh, requirements on new buildings. Um, and then we have a project called Lithium Valley, which is really to lift up lithium development in California. As we move to build a future beyond fossil fuels, we have to lean into this lithium ecosystem. So California is really fortunate to have a massive supply of lithium that's in a form that's very, very green to produce. So today, globally, almost all the lithium in the world comes from just four countries, Chile and Argentina, where it's um, in these evaporation ponds, and uh, China and Australia, where it's hard rock mining. Our lithium is in a geothermal uh, reserve, a uh, mile underground, and you can cycle the geothermal brine, get the lithium out, and we're um, going to be working to promote co-located battery manufacturing. So you're doing lithium production on site with battery manufacturing and really uh, bringing back the supply chain. Um, so altogether, you know, the, the sort of combined force of these efforts, along with energy efficiency and uh, direct air carbon capture, and energy storage, um, we believe that the clean energy future is absolutely achievable. Uh, and that there are a lot of benefits for our economy and for low-income communities uh, as we uh, lean into this and the opportunities that that will create. Um, I, I do want to highlight that last point that you know, as we invest in climate solutions and build out this infrastructure, it's really important to lift up the communities that have been hardest hit by pollution. And that's an absolute commitment across all of our programs. About 50% of the infrastructure we're putting in, EV charging and so forth is going into low-income communities. And that is uh, really important as we approach this. And that includes tribes. We have over uh, 150 
uh, federal and state recognized Native American tribes and we're funding, we just funded our eighth tribal microgrid last week uh, as part of our program to promote tribal energy sovereignty. So um, all this comes together as we build a clean energy future to lift up the communities that uh, have been hardest hit by pollution is a core of the strategy. So look forward to partnering with all of you and to the rest of the, the discussion today. Thanks, David, for sharing inspiring insights on California's energy leadership and glimpses into some of the future areas. So, um, we were hoping to have some questions in this section with our speakers, but we are a bit over time and we have an amazing roster of uh, speakers. So in the spirit of getting everyone's voices on the table, unfortunately, we're going to have to skip questions, um, um, David did. But thank you so much for bringing your leadership from California and you and uh, Sandra. Uh, from the UN. Uh, we will um, uh, now very quickly go into the next section. And um, thanks again for uh, joining us. Uh, our next section is the, uh, the dialogue on climate equity and climate adaptation. And we'll be hearing from leaders of two deeply inspiring organizations that are transforming lives of the most vulnerable, including remote indigenous communities, migrants and refugees impacted by climate change in South and Central Asia and Africa. It's an honor to introduce Asif Saleh, Executive Director of Barak Bangladesh since its founding in 1972 in Bangladesh, then one of the world's poorest countries. BRAC has grown to become one of the largest NGOs in the world with programs in Asia and Africa that reach more than 100 million people, providing them with tools to move from poverty into secure, resilient livelihoods. Prior to joining BRAC, Mr. Saleh worked as a policy specialist for the Access to Information Program at the Bangladesh Prime Minister's office. Earlier, he worked in key roles at Goldman Sachs, Glaxo Welcome, IBM, and Nortel. He's a fellow at the Center for Global Development in Washington, DC, an advisor at Millions Learning International and South African-based Innovation Edge, promoting early childhood development, the Brookings Institute, a global board member for Generation Unlimited, a global body of UNICEF promoting youth skills, and on the Global Governing Council of Water Resource Group 2030. He holds a bachelor degree in computer science and an MBA from New York University. Welcome, Asif. Thank you so much, Radhika. Really appreciate it. Um, and and uh, actually, thank you very much for having a separate section on adaptation because um, this is something that we don't hear about enough in the climate conversation, particularly in the Western space. Uh, because I think the urgency of it is not necessarily felt across the world. And that's what at, at least I'm seeing as I'm, I'm, I'm attending the COP. I mean, although the conversation has started around loss and damage and adaptation, um, but I think the challenge uh, here is very much around uh, not necessarily innovation, but really about financing. And um, uh, much more funding is needed for adaptation to avoid a tremendous and preventable loss of life and livelihoods. Uh, and there's something, um, uh, you know, if I just take the case of Bangladesh, for example, Bangladesh is at the forefront of climate change. I mean, we have made tremendous gain over the last 50 years, as uh, Sandra said uh, just a little while ago, that a lot of these gains are um, uh, kind of facing regression um, because of not only uh, COVID and then now uh, climate related disasters and also uh, a lot of these uh, sort of uh, climate, uh, the effect of climate change in general. Now, the question is that, you know, um, in, you know, in Bangladesh, for example, by 2050, 17.5% of the land is uh, uh, gonna be underwater. That's just if we keep the temperature under 1.5 degrees centigrade. Uh, but, you know, this, this year, our biggest worry is that 1.5 will move to 2.0, but luckily, uh, I think so far the negotiation, as far as we understand, that 1.5 is uh, still holding, and uh, U.S. government also has made a commitment to that. So that's the good news. But the bad news is that uh, the 17.5 percent is still gonna go underwater, but that's not gonna happen on on 2050. This is actually happening as we speak, right? As uh, every day, 2,000 people uh, enters Dhaka the capital uh, uh, from some of these most 
climate vulnerable cities and 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 that ha that is happening because they're losing their livelihood now um, i've just recently released a video uh, uh, that you can see in Brax page and also uh, various other uh, platforms like LinkedIn and others, where you will get a sense of what it's like to be in a place like that. And, and believe you not me, uh, it is like Waterworld, the Kevin Costner movie, um, where it's dystopian. I mean, the land that used to be uh, fertile um, and green with paddies are now barren. No crops are uh, uh, sort of uh, happening. Cultivation is happening because of salinity. There is not a drinkable water. Women have to travel by boat for one hour each way uh, to get just one jug of water. Um, there is a uh, um, um, food system is continuously getting disrupted uh, because of extreme heat. And that's just not in Bangladesh. And what we have seen uh, the uh, flood wise uh, uh, in terms of uh, we had a flood which is so extreme this year in the same area three times during the monsoon a flood has happened and uh, and and the last one of the three was so devastating and it came with such furious uh, fast and furiously that uh, it uh, basically in, within 24 hours it uh, completely submerged the, the, an entire district and people didn't even have a ch chance to move their livestock, um, um, which is the one of their biggest assets in this part of the world. Now, uh, and we have seen what has happened in Pakistan. Now, what, what basically in the stall Pakistan made in the COP, at the pavilion, the tagline said that what happens in Pakistan is not going to stay in Pakistan. Uh, that is true. Uh, and I think it's, it's a trailer before the big movie that's going to come out. Uh, are we ready for this? And I think the question is about equity. As this, uh, the uh, we are all in it this in this together. Uh, we all know this, but you know, just like what we heard that uh, whether it's in Europe and or the U.S., the social protection system is much stronger. Uh, and uh, unlike uh, countries like Bangladesh, Kenya, or Pakistan, now. Um, now that's one 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 side of the story, and the second side of the story is that um, uh, the people who are suffering the most are closest to the nature, uh, and uh, they are not uh, not suffering because of their lifestyle. They're suffering because of the lifestyle um, of other countries, and uh, and here I think the critical question is that whether big speeches are good enough. I think you know the commitments that have been made by uh, Western countries are not being kept. Um, we had uh, 2009, we basically, in the COP, there was a commitment of $100 billion by 2020. That hasn't been met because there has been no uh, enforcer in the first place. And now we are uh, basically seeing the effect of this, even the financing that has been made available. It's so hard to uh, access uh, that uh, none of, you know, we have uh, locally led uh, innovations that have come in to do this adaptation work around these food systems, uh, disaster responsive uh, housing and other things that are there, but there's just simply not any money to scale. So that has to change. I think I think it's, it's very important that uh, I think we're all talking about mitigation in the in the western world but at the same time equally important if not more urgent is to talk about adaptation and its financing so i would urge all of you who are present who are all influential positions to really uh, uh, take a fresh look at what's happening in this part of the world thank you thank you so much asif and and well received here within the united nations where um remembering the plight of the most vulnerable and the realities of, of what devastation uh, you describe is, is, our, is our, daily, our daily agenda item. And I think, you know, it's alliances like this one that we hope will, will broaden the shoulders that, that are bearing this weight. And so we, we feel that shared responsibility and we also, um, you know, can, can identify the, the solutions that will be adequate to, to face this. So, so thank you so much for joining us and, and um, really important to have BRAC, all of that leadership, um, the decades of BRAC's leadership have impacted my work um, for years. So, so really an honor also on a personal level to meet you. Um, it's now my, my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Mr. Nicholas McKinley, who is Global Director of Programs at the Aga Khan Foundation. 
Uh, Nicholas provides oversight and leadership to Aga Khan Foundation's global program portfolio. He's worked for Aga Khan Foundation in the UK as their CEO in India and in Portugal and has led their global civil society portfolio. Uh, prior to that, he worked in social services in London with refugees and asylum seekers in Southeast Asia and has held senior management positions um, in tech, media, and communications. Nicholas, over to you. Thank you very much. And first of all, I'd like to express uh, my thanks on behalf of Aga Khan Foundation uh, to, to Radhika and Keith for the kind invitation to join this uh, eminent panel held during these critical proceedings at COP27. Uh, the foundation is deeply committed to addressing the impact of climate change on some of the most vulnerable people in the world. And, and I just like to echo many of the comments that, that the, the eminent panelists have made. Uh, I mean, for us, when we look at the situation, the communities and the geographies and ecosystems where we are working hardly contribute to emissions, but the populations suffer the most severe consequences. We're working a lot around the Hindu Kush Pamir Mountains in Central Asia, including Afghanistan and Pakistan, and also in the Indian Ocean Coast. An example there of Tanzania, Madagascar, Mozambique, and in these different ecosystems, we're seeing the same decline in the quality of life of people that are living there. We address the topic of climate equity uh, directly through where we work. We work in some of the most remote uh, rural areas with communities that face uh, an, an unequally high burden uh, as a result of the climate extremes. We can see the impact every day on livelihoods, on habitat, through crop failures, extreme heat waves, the receding glaciers in the mountain ranges in Central Asia, as, as others have referred to, the floods in Pakistan, natural disasters. And we see people losing both homes and livelihoods. Um, so how do we approach this and how, how can we, you know, look at this situation, which is extremely challenging, uh, extremely critical, and, and how do we go about it? So in the few minutes uh, allocated now, I'd just like to talk a little bit about some of the ways we address this, some of the solutions that we are looking at, and maybe some, some ways we can improve the situation. Um, a lot of what we're doing is around nature-based solutions, looking at the value chains and products. We have a tremendous uh, emphasis on entrepreneurship, particularly through women entrepreneurs. We have multiple examples in many regions of the world where we have uh, community cooperatives, women's cooperatives building organic fertilizers, pesticides. We have solar irrigation systems being set up through rural farmers that have previously never worked on this technology. We've expanded our extension support services through digital technology, through how-to videos, and, and, and making you know, knowledge and learning more accessible. Another area is to reduce the burden on existing scarce rural assets. We're diversifying livelihoods and looking at how we can build uh, digital businesses, more green jobs, and looking at using the technology that's now available through models of uh, uh, upwork and outsourcing that people can get can, can live in one country and work in another. We're looking at a lot of uh, mobilization of, of uh, social support from companies. So many of the companies that the Aga Khan Network is investing and working with, like the Pakistan Serena Group and Habi Bank, are very active in terms of tree planting and emergency flood response. But I think what's really unique about how we go about this really is placing community at the center, uh, listening to people, finding out what's going on, looking at integrated approaches through in inputs, clean energy, uh, biodiversity, water management, but most of all really is the empowerment of the people that really need help to address these emer emergent needs and particularly women and young people who really are, you know, really at, the, at a very difficult end of, the, of this uh, situation. So as we build on 40 years of our work around nature-based solutions and clean energy, we are now committed to build, to plant an additional 50 million trees in the next few years to add to the 65 million we've planted. So we're really expanding rapidly into the protection and, and creation of mangroves on microforests using the Miyawaki method, 
building out clean energy through solar, hydro. We're aiming to generate 45,000 megawatts an hour per year. And, you know, all of these things really are, are, are really being driven by the communities that we work with. They're being managed, they're being run, they're being sustained, and they'll be maintained over many, many decades. We're working with around 600,000 farmers that are promoting their own climate smart practices that have incredible impact, not only on soil health, but also in improved yields, which now people are adopting these new climate smart methods in agriculture, which I think is a, a new green revolution. Um, beyond agriculture and clean energy, we're looking at our interventions in health and nutrition. Uh, we have an incubator and accelerator for business and startups in Central Asia called Accelerate Prosperity, which will be increasing support for thousands of businesses and new enterprises to look at adapting to climate change and building green jobs. And we're just launching at a side event at, uh, in Sharm El Sheikh, a new initiative with partners called Play Pluralism and the Planet to look at how we promote teachers and how teachers can drive forward solutions for, for climate I would like to emphasize the previous point that there's a lot of emphasis globally on mitigation, but for us, we see adaptation is the immediate need. Uh, and we are working on a lot of immediate adaptation solutions on irrigation driven uh, by solar, as I mentioned earlier, cons conserving soil moisture, river banking, greenhouses, uh, early sowing. Uh, fodder storage, forestation, uh, seed banks. There are so many things that can be done that are helping people adapt to the situation today. I would say that uh, one of the biggest factors that we could really address is how do we help the last mile, the last mile challenge for climate change? We need more investment in data on what's happening. We need more investment in adaptation to help communities adapt to the situation now. And we also need more investment so that we can build more of a carbon free culture and green growth. So I would like to end there. And I again, thank everyone again for giving us this time to speak and sharing some of the work that we're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. And thank you, Asif, for your leadership and the organization system changing work that leaves no one behind in a very integrated manner of climate and people. Um, your organizations are role models for the world and are very near and dear to my heart personally. Thank you again. In the spirit of again, I'm getting more voices on the table and I'm getting back on time. We are going to have to skip questions. Um, so thanks and uh, thank you for everything you do and for, for kind of them, the living the spirit of the SDGs of an integrated and holistic approach. Um, next, I would like to invite a discussion for very brief remarks. Uh, fellow Stanford alum David Gita Alvarez, representing the group Stanford Alumni in Sustainability, a co-convener in this um, event. David is managing partner at the Futura Fund for Puerto Rico and Impact, Invest uh, Impact Venture Studio, an early stage impact fund for food and energy systems innovation. He was engaged with the Puerto Rico Department of Economic Development and Commerce, exploring impact market sectors under new and existing tax incentive codes. He led the first SDG Impact Accelerator program to support Caribbean entrepreneurs and co-developed the first clean energy project accelerator in Puerto Rico, focusing on improving capital access. Over to you, David, for uh, some quick remarks. Thank you, Radhika. I really appreciate your, uh, the time and to be able to speak at this event today with uh, these honorable distinguished guests. Um, um, uh, yes, I just wanted to, to, to mention as well, I'm, I'm really happy to be a co-founder of both this interdisciplinary and intergenerational alumni network to help foster more meaningful connections. Um, and has organically really grown over 600 members in the last 18 months, um, really around the conversations of how do we both learn about the different intersectionalities of sustainability and foster connections with alumni from um, different stages of their careers, um, whether they're starting a company or they're just getting into different a different sector uh, that's different from maybe what they had studied. Um, and so uh, we're really excited about the power of the uh, Stanford Alumni and Sustainability as an impact network, really helping to foster those um, 
you know, kind of meaningful engagements and also um, connections that can um, lead to actions into the real world. Um, my background had been in helping as an early member of Stardex, the Stanford Startup Accelerator. So I um, and have been leading SDG based accelerators uh, here in Puerto Rico. And so that has been uh, really exciting to see how both by just con connecting both the talent and um, um, and those that are passionate, we can really foster some meaningful connections outside. And um, my work here in Puerto Rico is really um, has really been looking at the front lines of of climate change, at least from the Caribbean's perspective, and how Puerto Rico, um, despite some of these challenges, is really poised to help lead some of the um, testing of innovative opportunities with respect to sustainability um, in the world. Um, you know, there's 14 out of 17 achievable achievable SDGs and 85 out of the 169 sub targets uh, in Puerto Rico, and I we have a lot of STEM talent that can help to fulfill some of those innovation challenges. So our studio really helps to facilitate the system level innovation through collective impact programming and really looking at catalytic funding. And I think with respect to private capital in this conversation at this event, it's really important to see how we can align uh, certain types of catalytic capital products to the phases of sustainable development, to the uh, impact entrepreneurs journey as they're developing their the growth of their businesses and really nurture both the ecosystem and uh, allow for more access to different types of investors to be part of that uh, part of that success. So we're really excited to see how um, both Puerto Rico can contribute to the global conversation uh, and how we can help to both design some innovative catalytic products uh, as impact investors to achieve that. So we look forward to sharing that conversation as open, and we and we invite you to uh, to take a look at our open innovation um, challenge for 2023. And thank you for, for the time. Well, thank you so much, David, for uh, sharing uh, your remarks with us. And we look forward to uh, future collaboration. Uh, we're gonna move now to our, our next dialogue, which is a focus on uh, perspectives on the blue economy and oceans and climate education uh, from investors and academics. And I'll uh, introduce our, our, our speakers uh, one at a time and, and begin uh, with uh, professor uh, Vaughn Pratt is Professor Emeritus. Hi, Professor Pratt. Hi. Uh, last time I saw you was in the garden. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, two weeks ago. <laughs> exactly. So uh, Professor Pratt is a, a Professor Emeritus of Computer Science, Stanford, and um, he is uh, obtained a double honors degree in pure mathematics and physics from the University of Sydney and his PhD from Stanford University under uh, Donald Cook. Uh, Professor Pratt also taught at MIT from 1972 to 1980, and subsequently then at Stanford University until his retirement in 2000. Uh, after a decade of work on uh, packet workstations and autonomous vehicles in 2010, his interest turned to geophysics with a focus on global environmental change. Uh, he has made a number of presentations in this area uh, at the annual fall meetings of the American Geophysical Union. Uh, Professor Pratt's current research addresses the limited funds available uh, for slowing the rate of the rise uh, of atmospheric CO2, and arguing that $80 per ton of CO2 removed from the atmosphere as contemplated by American uh, Inflation Reduction Act is too expensive to have any appreciative, an appreciative impact. His present research is focused on methods capable of removing a ton of CO2 from the atmosphere at less than $10 a ton. So we look forward to those marks Professor Pratt. Well, thank you, Keith, and uh, thank you, Radhika, for uh, inviting me. Uh, I think I'm uh, the main academic here, uh, and uh, so you're going to see how academics uh, communicate, well, maybe not to uh, general audiences like you guys, but uh, at least to their uh, peers, and uh, so uh, I'm going to start uh, sharing uh, my screen here. Uh, here we go. So uh, this is going to be a, a typical academic talk. Uh, and uh, it's about capping CO2 at 450 parts per million without disrupting civilization. And that includes without disrupting all of these other uh, plans uh, for how to solve uh, our big problem uh, of global warming. Uh, so we can proceed completely independently with this approach. Okay. Um, so uh, the IPCC uh, recommends, oh, and let me start my timer, uh, that. Um, in its six assessment report, uh, it wants it's offering five ways to meet 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2030. Now, as we heard from Asif 10 minutes ago, uh, we're already at 1.5 degrees Celsius. And as we've heard from Bill Gates elsewhere, 
um, we might get there by 2050, say. So there's a certain uh, problem here between uh, the target versus the time. Uh, the, here's the uh, five uh, approaches that uh, the IPCC has suggested for uh, this uh, rather ambitious goal uh, by 2030. Um, and uh, my claim uh, my, uh, is that um, all five of these recommendations uh, disrupt civilization which makes 2030 completely unrealistic because disrupting civilization is not something you can do in 10 years. Now, uh, the solution that I'm proposing here is to drop where emitted, namely uh, CCS, carbon capture and storage at the points of emission, drop that requirement uh, from the IPCC recommendation. The reason they want that uh, requirement uh, is because they don't believe that direct air capture is feasible or economic and so they say, ignore it. Okay, that's basically my talk. That's it, we're done. So everything else that I'm going to say is simply corroborative detail. All right, so this is what things look like. Uh, here's CO2 rising from below 380 back in 2000 to 420 uh, now. Uh, if this keeps going, we're going to be hitting 520 by about uh, 2050. Um, what I'm proposing is that within 10 years, the same, uh, and it's not even 10 years from 2020, it's 10 years from now, so in other words, 2033, I'm proposing that we implement something that caps CO2 at 450, so that instead of keeping on rising, it stays there. Now, why is that a good thing to aim for? Um, well, um, if we replace the 1.5 degree C target by a CO2 cap of 450 parts per million, First of all, it's easier to design to. All the numbers are much more precisely known than they are for uh, temperature. Climate is a very complicated thing. CO2 is a relatively simple thing. And secondly, uh, the impact will be measurable much sooner. The moment that we see um, the climb, which comes out every month or even every day, really, uh, the moment we see it suddenly dropping, we can say, hey, uh, we're making progress. Whereas with temperature, we have no idea because temperature fluctuates all over the place. It will take one or two decades to see if there's any impact. Okay, um, so these will disrupt civilization and so they'll take many decades. And so my proposal uh, is to adopt uh, that fourth one from, this, uh, from the IPCC, but in the form of direct air capture, also known as carbon dioxide removal. So first of all, no disruption of civilization and also no disruption of all the other ways of going about it. They can proceed independently of this. And secondly, it's location independent. Namely, uh, it is, uh, can be done either at uh, land or sea. Okay, so to achieve that, uh, by 2033, we must be removing, every year we must be removing 27 gigatons of CO2. Now I don't see anybody having realized that we have to re remove that much, and it's a huge amount, that's probably what's scaring the IPCC. Nevertheless, that will cap CO2 at 450 parts per million if we can do it. All right, well, at the current offer of about $100 a ton, that'll be about $2.7 trillion a year. Um, all the numbers I've heard so far uh, make this really unaffordable. I mean, some people do talk about $10 trillion. We heard, in fact, uh, a figure of $10 trillion earlier this, this morning, uh, but um, uh, that was not per year. So $2.7 trillion a year is unaffordable. So if we can get the price down to $10 a ton, uh, it might be affordable. Um, so um, I'm proposing uh, to skip uh, the um, uh, skip uh, carbon capture and utilization altogether because there's no market for that, not, nothing that big anyway. Um, and to use ocean because first of all, it's got more storage. And secondly, uh, it has uh, what can be called free dispatchable energy, which is not obvious, but uh, that's, that's the key to affordability. All right, so here's my final slide. Um, that, occupy, that much per year occupies one and a half cubic kilometers of air per second if you're going to process that much. Uh, if you're moving, able to move that air at near the speed of sound, which I claim can be done, that must pass through um, uh, several hectares. Um, a floating unit with 15 miles each, 30 meters wide, is about one hectare. And um, if we can reduce the cost uh, to uh, 10 billion, uh, to, um, uh, to 5.4 billion per unit, we can achieve uh, the $10 per ton amount. So uh, that's all I have to say.
Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Pat, uh, for your for your vision and your remarks. Uh, and we are here in this uh, dialogue speaking about issues of blue economy. Uh, and the blue economy is, as folks know, it's the, the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic gain and to improve livelihoods and jobs and the ocean ecosystem health. There's a lot of manifestations of that. And the next uh, gentleman and leader uh, that uh, we'll be hearing from uh, presently is um, uh, someone who has deep experience within this space. And we're very pleased to have you, uh, Mr. Goga, um, with us today. And Mr. Craig Koga is a co-founder of Apollo Global Management and a founder and uh, chairman and CEO of Pegasus Capital. Uh, he has spent a career building successful investment businesses. He founded Pegasus, a private equity fund in 1995 and serves as its chairman and its CEO and as a men member of the management committee and the investment committee. Uh, through Mr. Koga's leadership, Pegasus has focused on sectors influenced by global resource scarcity and the need to combat climate change, as well as on the growth and demands globally for human health and wellness, leading Pegasus, becoming the first US private equity fund manager to be accredited by the Green Climate Fund. And that's amazing. Uh, Pegasus currently manages the Global Subnational Climate Fund, which is focused on climate mitigation in emerging markets, uh, as well as the Global Fund for the Coral Reefs, uh, which is an oceans-focused adaptation fund that seeks to enhance the resiliency of coral reef ecosystems. Uh, in 1990, Mr. Kogut co-founded and was one of the original partners at Apollo, in a position that he held for six years preceding the creation of Pegasus. He is currently vice chairman of the board of directors of Pantherix. In addition, he has been an active philanthropist in the fields of improving education, building civil society, and championing environmental and health issues. He currently serves as chairman of the Finance Advisory Board of the Global Alliance for a Sustainable Planet, a nonprofit focused on leveraging private finance for public good in order to achieve the sustainable development goals. And Mr. Kogut is an alum, alumnus of Brown University and Harvard Law School. We're very pleased to have you uh, today, Mr. Kogut. Thank you. It's really an honor to be here. And I'm just back from uh, 3.30 in the morning. I landed in New York. And if I'm a little tired uh, after 10 days at COP um, and a little disjointed, forgive me. Um, it, it really is, it, listening to the panelists, there's so, so much to talk about. But let me um, say our journey started in the United States, investing back in 2002 in sustainability at Pegasus. Um, as you mentioned, we just uh, ultimately, um, the global south, I think, as you've heard from other speakers, is the front lines of the climate challenges, the impacts on vulnerable communities, and the um, biodiversity and um, nature they depend on for livelihoods, they're our most vulnerable community. So we began to focus on investing in our natural resources, what, what are the true natural resources, the oceans, the forests, and the land. Um, the oceans are, it, it, as you heard from the professor, the potential of the oceans is amazing, and yet we spend very little on the oceans, whether philanthropically or investment-wise. Um, we've created two blended finance vehicles, as you've heard, with um, the Green Climate Fund as our um, key partner to invest in these areas. And um, you know, I just coming back from COP, I would say there's reason to be very pessimistic um, with the challenges as you hear about in Bangladesh and. Um, Pakistan, um, but as, as you also heard, there is hope, there are models, and maybe let me touch, especially speaking at Stanford, in the global south, it is not about whether it's the oceans or trees, it is not about technology primarily. Um, we're very involved with the California Hydrogen Hub, we're involved with direct air capture and other things, but in the global south, there are things that can be done, there's tremendous entrepreneurship, there's tremendous, if you focus on local communities, if you focus on working with local governments and you bring new business models, things like cold storage for sustainable fishing doesn't exist in most places. Um, that can be, we're investing in things like that with our, the Fund for Coral Reefs. We're investing in waste, waste um, facilities where you have to deal with local governments and local communities and collecting plastics in the oceans. It's all about 
and poor empowering local communities. And I think what's encouraging to me about COP, um, away from the politics and a, a lot of what's going on in terms of the reparation discussion is there is a will, including with some very enlightened corporations, not most, but with some, um, to deal with their supply chains, to deal with things like plastic pollution, but it starts on the ground and creating incentives for the local, local populations and municipalities to come up with, to deploy solutions that exist. Um, you can look at, I'll talk about something land-based, read about Fonio, we're doing an amazing project in Mali, I think. There are lots of, lots of things that can work today and um, these informal and formal alliances are beginning to be formed. And that was the most encouraging part of COP. Um, and from where we're sitting, um, resilience is where the action is. Um, for most of these countries, um, they're not polluters. But I think the good news is not only is there a need and moral imperative as an investor to, to invest in resilient solutions, but I think there's a tremendous opportunity in the Global South. They have great people, they have sun, they have land, and they have lots of soil and lots of ocean resources. So as an investor, um, I'm very encouraged um, if we can form these coalitions about investing. Well, thank you so much, you know, again, for your, your, your long time commitment and your insight and your vision and your, your, your comments about things being local uh, it really speaks to uh, some matters of and resilience to our next speaker, who is in the education space. And uh, it's clear that climate resilience and the need for uh, skills and, and tech understanding for students uh, and, and a respect for youth voices, uh, that also too, as Mr. Koga had described, uh, really needs to be at the table at a local, uh, a local level primarily. So now I'd like to introduce Ms. Darlene uh, Fukuji. Um, she is the director at the Beldegren Center for Innovative Leadership at the Brentwood School. Uh, Darlene has focused on preparing students to engage with real world challenges and explore solutions within and beyond the classroom. She was formerly the associate director and a clinical professor at Loyola Marymount University's Fred Keisner Center for Entrepreneurship, where prior to that she had obtained her BA and her MBA. Ms. Fukuji is passionate about startups education, family businesses, socially responsible enterprises, design thinking, problem solving, and equity to improve the world. That's a lot. <laughs> Darlene was also an engagement manager at GrowThink, a boutique consulting and investment banking firm for entrepreneurs, where she helped more than 250 companies start, grow, and exit. Outside of work, Darlene is also the president of the Toshika Taikatsu Foundation, secretary of the Westchester Rotary Foundation Board of Trustees, and serves as a board member for the Jacaranda School for Orphans in Malawi, and also with women leaders and family enterprises and the social enterprise Balthazar and Rose, as well as a member of the YMCA Teen Task Force focusing on teen engagement and teen mental health. Thank you so much for your presence today with us, Ms. Fukuji. Uh, and let's go to it. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, your excellencies and distinguished guests, it's an honor to share the incredible work our student leaders play um, you know, in this COP27 discussion. Students are paving the way and time and time again, they have shown they are the leaders of today. I'm here today to give you a glimpse of hope at the Beldegren Center for Innovative Leadership, BCIL, at Brentwood School, community members engage with real world challenges and explore solutions within and beyond the classroom. Like many other students across the world, our students take the UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals seriously. We use Stanford's design thinking skills um, as the approach and to solve these sustainable and feasible solutions to our world's most pressing challenges. And I wanna emphasize the time is really now to support them. Our middle school students are taking the renewable energy concepts they were taught in their science courses and solving the challenge of green buildings and reducing carbon emissions in local economies. Um, in two weeks, they will be submitting their solutions in the Nifty World Series of Innovation. 
Uh, last week, uh, our students had the opportunity to learn about 1% for the planet through professor and entrepreneur Rochelle Webb. Uh, many of you might know of 1% for the planet because its founder, um, Yvonne Chenard, is also the founder of Patagonia. And our students um, had the platform to present their solutions and strategies in an effort to get more companies to see the urgency of saving our planet. And I pause and I question why students are still convincing adults of the urgency to save our planet. Um, and I also want to give a glimpse of hope in what the students are doing and paving their way in the field of STEAM. Our applied science program headed up by scientists and astronaut candidate, Dr. Ideal Gonzalez Cerricio. This program is the intersection of STEM and social justice. And through Dr. G's mentorship, the students are coming up with amazing patent pending environmental solutions. Some of these solutions um, with your help have the potential to build back our world better and reduce the number of environmental refugees we are seeing today. Lily, for example, is researching ants and their ability to sequester carbon dioxide in our environment. Like kelp, it can be a natural and sustainable way to reduce our CO2s. Jonah is looking at sustainable, rechargeable, and moldable battery using slime. He is on a mission to ensure that batteries don't create waste and harm. How can we continue to support green energy without sustainable energy solutions. Lastly, um, and this is just a flavor of the projects that they are doing, um, Ruby and Max are looking at how C. elegans, a certain type of worm for those of you um, unfamiliar, um, they're looking at how they survive and thrive in arid environments and produce nutrients that would be beneficial to plant life. The impacts of their research can be a solution to the food insecurity um, hazardous pollution to our crippling natural disasters um, and reduce the negative impacts on the environmental crisis that affect people of color at much higher rates in their communities. All of their projects have a sustainable and feasible solution towards a number of the 17 sustainable development goals. Public-private partnerships in this context could look like helping these students obtain their provisional patents and take this a step further, um, securing financing to support their research and implementation into the real world. I promised you a glimpse of hope and I leave you with this. Student leaders have the distinctive power of creativity to, re to reach the 17 sustainable development goals. Um, and maybe by 2030, who knows? We just need to provide them with the guidance and resources they need. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Professor Pratt, um, Craig, Darlene, for intellectually stimulating, inspiring, insightful perspectives. Next, I would like to invite a very brief perspective from discussant Luke Langley, a partner at AIM Partners, an impact fund that invests in businesses with differentiated technologies to solve climate change problems and achieve strong risk adjusted returns within 10 years. The AIM team comprise, comprises of investors, entrepreneurs, operators, and researchers with 50% of the assets invested in women founders and CEOs. Welcome, Luke. Hello, and uh, thank you for the, the introduction and kindly inviting me to, um, to discuss and introduce AIM at this event. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, I'm Luke and I'm a partner at AIM Partners, um, and we're a California UK based fund um, that was, as mentioned, invests in differentiated technologies to solve climate change and achieve strong returns within 10 years. Uh, just to build on the introduction, uh, I spent most of my career focused on finding differentiated solutions to key social environmental problems that align financial and impact returns. And partly by being a mathematician by training, um, I've always focused we focused on systems modeling. I have a particular interest in developing our financial technology and impact metrics, which are you know, to use to identify, manage, scale and exit companies to have the desired impact that, that we hope for. Um, so at AIM, um, we focus on companies that are in market with an evidence of product market fit, revenues and customer traction. 
We do this by targeting a $17 trillion market opportunity with four key sectors, energy transition, alternate materials, agriculture and food systems, and data and digitization. Within this, we focus on addressing problems that um, where there is an addressable large and growing market, um, which ties to having um, a large and growing impact. And therefore, we'll have a strong risk-adjusted returns while getting to the scale necessary to achieve the impact we desire within 10 years. Um, the inflection point we focus on is highlighted by for every dollar that we've invested, our portfolio companies have raised an additional $125 of external follow-on capital from top-tier private equity and venture funds. Fund one is on track to um, meet our uh, targets around greenhouse gas emissions reduction, but over the lifetime of the fund. Um, and as mentioned, although we don't screen for it, we do focus on diversity inclusion with 50% of our portfolio led by women and or people of color. So, um, and, and uh, we have a 10 year track record of investing within climate change, um, typically achieving top quartile uh, financial performance while benefiting 3 million people worldwide um, both uh, in in um, in US, Europe, and and um, some of the other countries talking about. Um, so we believe uh, climate is the single biggest threat to ocean health. To solve it, we need to focus on technology innovation to stay below the two degree scenario. As mentioned, we're already hitting the one and a half degrees, but we see it's necessary to have technology innovation to avoid some of the largest impacts, both in terms of economic. Um, as well as key other issues like yield loss, ocean health, with marine fisheries um, being halved if you hit above two degrees versus staying within the scenario where we are now. We also believe it's important to go beyond carbon to focus on other areas such as methane and nitrogen to avoid um, some of the key issue areas such as um, ocean health depletion with things like hypoxia um, with nitrogen um, nutrient pollution. And uh, by going beyond carbon and looking at other areas such as biodiversity and taking a systems view, we focus on identifying key solutions that can solve these problems. And um, yeah, so I think I'll just pause there because I think we're hitting hitting my time. But um, just to uh, kind of round off, in addition to um, focusing on the kind of environmental problem by taking that systems view, we also see it's important to um, focus on equity by stewarding change within the companies that we focus on to achieve that 50% capital deployed within, we put, pe within uh, women and people of colour to help really build um, more uh, climate justice and equitable uh, future within climate change. So yeah, thank you for letting me share some quick high level overview of AIM partners with you today. And um, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Luke, uh, again, for your commitment and your uh, passion and professionalism uh, in the space. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Miss um, Johanna von Ritter. Uh, she is the uh, Associate Director of Private Fund Investments Management uh, at and Private Fund Investments at Align Impact. Uh, and she also uh, serves as a member of, of Stanford Angels uh, and Entrepreneurs of Southern California. Um, Align Impact is an impact investing advisory firm uh, directing family office and foundation capital towards impact. And Johanna's work and manager selection includes sourcing investment opportunities across uh, various asset classes and thematic areas, uh, and conducting deep financial and impact due, dil due diligence, uh, and reporting on portfolios. Uh, Johanna joined Align Impact in 2019 after completing her graduate studies at Yale and holding impact investing roles at Agora Partnerships in Colombia and, and investing for good in the United Kingdom. Uh, previously, uh, Johanna worked with various nonprofit organizations in the United States, Panama and Colombia, and she was the country associate for the Clinton Health Access Initiative, where she led national level operations in Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, and El Salvador, uh, partnering with ministries of health to eliminate malaria. Guijana also served as uh, the Peace Corps volunteer in Paraguay uh, as a community mobilizer and health educator, where she co-founded the nonprofit Encarnacion uh, Sustainable, and Guijana holds an MBA and a Master of, of Global Affairs from Yale University and a BA from Stanford uh, University. As a, we're very, very pleased to have you, uh, Kiana, and uh, thank you so much for your remarks. Thank you, Keith, uh, appreciate it. And um, I will be swift as we are here over time, but appreciate the intro and it's great to be here with all of you. 
Um, as Keith mentioned, I work with Align Impact. We help high net worth and family offices channel capital towards what's important, towards um, impact across the globe and towards SDGs. And uh, we feel it's particularly important right now as the biggest uh, wealth transfer in history is occurring as we speak uh, in the US alone, 50 trillion um, and quite a bit elsewhere as well. Um, to, to be brief, since today, the two topics of conversation were blue economy and the energy transition, um, I'll share what we are excited about in each of those two fields. Within blue economy, uh, seaweed, bivalves, coral reefs, coastal communities um, are all at the epicenter of our investment theses as are sustainable fishing practices and uh, improved aquaculture practices. And uh, we were actually um, quite a bit in touch with Pegasus, um, appreciated Craig's remarks on their global fund for coral reefs, which is doing really important work in emerging markets, um, as well as with um, AIM um, on their um, earlier fund um, with a, a focus on oceans as well. Um, within energy transition, we are actually at a, I think, a really exciting transition point where we previously had been backing quite a bit of utility scale wind and solar in developed markets. And we're now marking that as a check mark and saying institutional investors are coming into the space. We as impact investors no longer need to fill that gap. And so we're excited to be pulling out of utility um, wind and solar in developed markets and instead leaning our renewable energy investing in emerging markets um, across all renewable technologies, as well as some community solar and CNI uh, commercial and industrial scale in developed markets. So I would mark that as a success for the finance community to see traditional investors that don't associate themselves with impact to be taking over utility scale renewables. Um, something else that we're very keen on is nature-based solutions, um, but I believe that is a bit outside of scope for today. So I'll leave that excitement on regenerative agriculture and uh, forestry and conservation for another conversation. Uh, but underlying all of these different investment strategies, it is absolutely crucial for us and every single investor in the space to keep local community empowerment underpinning all of these CCs. Um, indigenous leadership, climate justice, particularly with regards to the most vulnerable populations, is extraordinarily important. I really appreciated Asif's comments on global climate just justice and recognizing that the most vulnerable populations on earth are those that are closest to earth um, in terms of their livelihoods, so farmers and fishers. So maintaining that um, front and center, remaining um, loyal to indigenous community empowerment is key. Um, thanks very much. I'll turn it back to you, Keith. Thank you so much, Gianna. Uh, now we're gonna turn this over to, uh, to Lisa, to, uh, to, to lead us to the promised land. <laughs> well, colleagues, it's 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 almost impossible to sum up um, all the different perspectives uh, that came through in the last 90 minutes. It's been extremely rich, extremely diverse, and I think it really speaks to um, the the plethora of stakeholders and the the interdisciplinary challenges that we all face. What what I did find to be common across every speaker was passion, commitment, and a determination to to be a part of, um, in, you know, ensuring that we, whether it's 1.5 or, or, or 2.0 professor, but we're all part of that change. Um, and we're being very practical in what that means. And we're also not leaving anyone behind as we try to, to find those solutions. I think, you know, even just in this last dialogue to move from, from young people to, to the investors, to, to those who are already, um, you know, working in, in the development space, um, it really shows that um, the SDGs um, serve as that uh, North Star, so to speak. Um, and, and they are stormy waters right now. Uh, COP27 is demonstrating that. I think all of us that were there last week felt both this tremendous hope, especially from the youth pavilion, which was pulsing um, well into the, into the moonlight, but at the same time, the reality of, of, the, of the negotiations and where they still can be stuck um, with less than 24 hours to go. So to me, um, the, the gratitude I have to Radhika and Keith, to all the speakers today um, is only growing um, with each and every engagement that we do through this effort to really um, help each other find one another as we all try to move towards the SDGs. 
the Joint SDG Fund is, is grateful to be in any way um, a, an alignment, uh, a convener, a broker, and wants the UN to be seen as a, as a partner always that's, that's fit for purpose. I think going into the digitalization space, going into the renewable space um, is going to need many, many more experts. Um, and so that's why an alliance like this one is so critical. Um, without the tech and without that storytelling, um, I don't believe the changes will happen fast enough. So sincerest thanks again to, to all of our esteemed speakers. This is by no means the end of the Breakthrough Alliance. These events have been the launch of the Alliance. And I think um, I'm looking forward very much to uh, brainstorming with, with Keith and Radhika about next steps, about work planning for 2023. So don't be surprised uh, when you, when you uh, have emails from us um, looking for ways to really deepen this engagement and, and form it into uh, mechanisms that can really deepen the conversation and, and the steps forward. So sincerest thanks, apologies for going over time, but we really did have such phenomenal interventions that we didn't wanna not share, share that opportunity. Um, and we look forward to, to working with you uh, in the months and years to come. All the very best, thank you.